Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. Uh, This is Jesus speaking. Uh, He is speaking to a crowd uh, which include his disciples plus also his opponents. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. All of you, take up my yoke and learn from me because I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for yourselves. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, There's a sermon outline inside your service sheets. And uh, this is a one-off sermon. Once a year on Reformation Sunday, we do a sermon that is not necessarily just rooted in the scriptures, but aims to look at history. And so there won't be as much diving all over the Bible, but we will touch on the passage from Luke and Matthew. And it seems quite ironic when we learn how much Zwingli didn't stray from the Bible, but we're just doing that for today and seeing how we go. Uh, But I want to think, I'm at point one of the outline, I want to think about some of your simple actions in life. And there are plenty of complicated actions in life, but there are some simple actions, aren't there? Uh, Eating a sausage, mowing the lawn, brushing your teeth, having a cup of tea, If you think about it, our lives are full of very simple actions and those simple actions can often have an impact even if we are unaware of them. Uh, The simple fact of inviting someone to sit with you and have a cup of tea, that's not that complicated, is it? But imagine the impact that might have on someone. Uh, Eating food in front of someone in a certain way, a simple action might have a profound impact on someone else. In fact, sometimes we can look at our simple actions and use them to remind us of profound truths that are not that complicated but have an immense impact. Today, as Kim has mentioned, we're going to spend time with a really simple bloke. Ulrich Zwingli was not complicated. He was operating in a very complicated time in history, but he was a simple man who did simple things who simply had an enormous impact because he thought through what his actions would do. We're going to spend some time today with Ulrich Zwingli. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture of him and then we're going to dive into God's word and Zwingli's life together. That's Zwingli. I uh, hope you'll notice uh, what he looks like. He's, uh, this is uh, in Zurich. Uh, he's standing there. Uh, in one hand is a sword. In the other hand is a Bible. Okay, and we're going to come to those in a moment. Let me pray and we look at Zwingli together. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for your history. I thank you that at various points in history, you have brought us back to the truth of that one man in history, Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, today we're using a lot of strange words and we're doing some unfamiliar things. But as we do so, please remind us of your work in history to drag your people back to the truth of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Uh, The Reformation, I I think Kim's summary was an absolute corker. Uh, I can't top it, but I'm going to try, at least add some more words. Uh, The Reformation was a certain point in history that officially began in 1517. Uh, The actions of a German monk called Martin Luther, and we've heard about Martin Luther over a number of years. Uh, In essence, the action of Luther plus a number of other men and women drew God's mob back to the truth of God's word, that Jesus Christ alone, in his life, death and resurrection alone, is the only way in which human sin can be dealt with. It's by God's grace alone, received by faith alone, revealed in God's word alone, pointing to the significance of God himself alone. That truth, whilst burbling away beneath the surface and touched on over a couple of hundred years beforehand, finally burst forth from the period from 1517, completely transformed Europe. And not only Europe theologically, but Europe socially and politically. Uh, Let me give a brief plug for a podcast I love listening to, The Rest is History. 
A terrific podcast, 40 Minute Chunks of History. Uh, one of the ones I listened to this week said, the Reformation was the first time you had social media. And it completely transformed the way people thought, from songs to pamphlets to meals together. Uh, most political scientists would say that the modern nation state emerged at the Reformation. Liberal democracy and the rise of liberal economics, basically how we do life here, that's the Reformation. But most importantly, it drew people back to the truth of God's word in Jesus Christ alone. And out of the Reformation grew the area of Christianity labelled as Protestantism today. comes from the word protest. And as members of the Anglican Church of Australia, or at least attenders, this is our history. This is where we are from. Uh, today we're going to meet Ulrich Zwingli. Um, at point two on the outline, uh, Zwingli uh, was a Swiss man. And can I get those going? Next slide, please. Uh, Zwingli was a Swiss man. Uh, that's Switzerland. Uh, if you don't know where Switzerland is, okay, it's in Europe. Uh, it's renowned for being a country that held neutrality but also sold its soldiers to other nations to fight their wars. Switzerland is renowned for its trade in mercenaries. Uh, Switzerland is quite unique in Europe in that it's made up of a federation of self-governed cantons or states. In essence, that made the Reformation their very heart because each canton made its own decision. Kind of like sometimes how we work during COVID, hey? As cantons butted against cantons and then as alliances were formed with outside powers and they came in. Zwingli grew up in Switzerland and he grew up in a particular part of Switzerland called Glarus, which you see just there. I'm just going to make up the pronunciations because I'm a bit of ochre like that. He grew up in Glarus and he was born there and we'll turn to that in a moment. Another interesting fact about Zwingli is contained in this quote and I want you to listen very carefully. This is from Zwingli himself. Before anyone in Switzerland had ever heard of Martin Luther, I began to preach the gospel in 1516 so that I never entered the pulpit without looking up the words which were to be read in the mass that day, expanding them on the basis of scripture. I started preaching the gospel before I'd even heard of Martin Luther's name. Luther, whose name I did not know for at least another two years, had definitely not instructed me. I followed holy scripture alone. Did you catch the significance of that? And we're going to see the significance of God's word alone. Martin Luther is renowned as the man who brought the Reformation in 1517, but Zwingli was preaching the gospel a full year ahead in Switzerland, in a canton, and it didn't break out until much later. The lives of Zwingli and Luther are actually quite remarkable in how similar they are. They were born only seven weeks apart. Zwingli was born on January the 1st, 1484, and Zwingli was born in the eastern part of modern-day Switzerland. His family was wealthy enough for him to attend the University of Vienna, where he gained a bachelor's degree in 1504, a master's degree in 1506. Immediately after university, he was ordained into the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church. His first parish was in his childhood town of Glarus. Can you imagine that? Your first job as a minister is in your own hometown. And here he observed something that affected him for the rest of his life. At this point, like many of the other priests, he was a chaplain in the Swiss army with Swiss mercenaries. He would go to war with them as these men were sold for the service of other authorities. And as he watched these men die far from home, it transformed his view of human life, of economics and politics, and of the way God's word would be applied. In fact, he's renowned as being one of the few men who stood up against this trade in humanity, and it cost him immensely. Uh, early in his work as a priest, Zwingli was exposed to the work of a man named Erasmus. Erasmus is actually the root of the Reformation. Erasmus was an academic who'd revolutionised humanities, that's basically arts degrees, by saying, get back to the sources. Erasmus was the man 
who took everyone in academia back to the Bible in the original language. Not in Latin, but in Hebrew and Greek. Zwingli gained one of the first copies of Erasmus's Greek New Testament and he devoured it and memorized it. Can you imagine that? Memorizing the Greek New Testament. That occurred around 1514 to 1516 and he actually met Erasmus face to face. Uh, The path from here to the Reformation was brief. By 1516, Zwingli was proclaiming the truth of the good news of Jesus afresh. This is what he said in 1523. Listen carefully. The summary of the gospel is that our Lord Jesus Christ, true Son of God, has made known to us the will of his heavenly Father and has redeemed us from death and reconciled us with God by his guiltlessness. And that's what he was proclaiming by 1516. By 1519, Zwingli had been elected the parish priest of the main church in Zurich, and you can see Zurich there, and from here he was at the forefront of the Reformation in Zurich and then Switzerland more widely. Uh, We're going to look at his reforms in a moment, but Zwingli was unlike Luther in that he died young, 47. Luther lived to a cranky old age, and he really was cranky. Zwingli died young. Zwingli was a chaplain and was part of the forces in the Capel Wars. There were two of them. Those wars were an effort by Zurich to force the other Swiss cantons to join the Reformation. In 1531, get this, along with 30 other priests, he lost his life on the battlefield. In fact, to the best of my knowledge, he is the only reformer to die in war for what he believed. His enemies so destroyed, desecrated and damaged his body that he was unrecognisable because they didn't want any artefacts or sacraments to emerge from him. And so the work of Zwingli was finished at that point by him. But if you can summarise in four key events, you'll see them there in your outline. And and I want to apologise. I probably haven't put as much effort into this sermon as I should have. And uh, a lot of the sources that we're looking at are secondary or third. Uh, But there is a new biography of Zwingli that's just come out uh, this year. And uh, I'll get the title and recommend it to you. Uh, I've read some reviews and it looks great. I'm at point three on the outline. God's word was revealed in Zwingli's preaching. Uh, We must not underestimate the regard with which Zwingli held God's word. He was incredibly passionate about its truth, its proclamation, and its practice. At the heart of Zwingli and everything he did was God's word. The return to the original languages of God's word was the key development that led to the Reformation. Returning to the original Hebrew and Greek, led to the rediscovery of God's word as it was, not God's word as it was mediated by the church. God's word as it was. For in all controversies concerning faith and religion, divine scripture alone rather than oral tradition ought to be the measure and rule for us. God's word. God's word. And that transformed the life of God's mob. It transformed it in a number of ways, from making God's word available to the average citizen in their own language. We get pew Bibles because of this, in our, in our own English, not in another language, to a rethinking and rediscovery of some really key theological concepts like justification, right through to the idea that every pew warmer should be involved in ministry, not just the people up the front and to the flourishing of literacy. All of that can be laid at the foot of get back to the sources, go back to God's word. Uh, In Zwingli's case, well before anyone else, it transformed his preaching. It transformed his preaching. He rethought what he was doing. And so on January the 1st, 1519, he did something amazingly radical. He started preaching through God's word verse by verse. No one had ever done it before in this way. Usually there was a lectionary put together with four readings taken from various parts of the Bible so that over three years you'd hear all the Bible read and they were random and you would preach on one of those four readings. Zwingli said, no, I'm going to start with verse 1 of Matthew chapter 1 and I'm just going to preach verse by verse every week. 
It was known as Lectio Continua, and he simply worked his way through the books of the Bible verse by verse, expounding it as it was in front of people as God's word. Now, for people in the pew, that was pretty radical <laughs> to put aside the lectionary and just preach from the Bible. But it was, it was radical on a, on a much deeper level because it, it now meant that you understood a word in context, not separate from all the other words around it, not one of four random readings. But you would look at this word where it was in Matthew's gospel and where Matthew was in the whole Bible and then the whole bo- you would suddenly understand all of God's word as a unity. From Genesis to Revelation, one consistent narrative. And it was aided by the translation of God's word into the language of the people and a growth in literacy as people were trained to read. For Zwingli, this was the guts, God's word, the supreme, final and source of all authority because it revealed the very nature and work of God himself. It was the fundamental authority understood in community for all the activities of God's mob because it actually made God's mob through Jesus Christ. And because of that passionate love of God's word, we have the affair of the sausages, which Kim hinted at in the kids' talk. And the affair of the sausages, and I just love this, a sausage supper, serving the best of the worst. And I actually found a number of pictures in in Zurich butcheries of Zwingli sausages, uh, the sausages that were served on that line. He'd been parish priest, I'm at point four on the island, parish priest for a number of years in Zurich. He'd consistently preached through God's word. 1518, he spoke up clearly about the established church's practice of selling salvation, of buying your way to heaven or buying a place in heaven. By 1522, The town council supported, if not the Reformation, at least Zwingli's habit of preaching through God's word. And on March 9, 1722, in the middle of Lent, a local printer held dinner. Now, we don't realise how important printers were. Printers uh, affected the transfer of knowledge in a town. They were remarkably important men because if they printed something, you read it. And they were held in high esteem and they were quite wealthy. Uh, This printer decided to hold a meal with his wife, two priests and his workers. Funnily enough, the number at the meal was 12. And at that meal, in the middle of Lent, the printer served smoked sausages. The next day, he and his workers were arrested. They'd broken canon law, church law that stated that it was wrong a sin to eat meat during Lent. Zingley was not arrested. He didn't eat, he only inhaled. And on March 16, 1722, Zwingli preached a sermon in the great church in Zurich and it was titled, On the Choice and Freedom of Foods. Simple things, hey? Simple things. Uh, amongst a number of texts taken from God's word, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30 was the foundation of what Zwingli preached. We've we just heard that read, haven't we? Zwingli attacked religious laws and customs that were not to be found in God's word, but which had been imposed on God's mob and made legal for salvation. Zwingli's message was quite clear. All such rules and regulations, customs and practices from the posture you needed to adopt during certain parts of the service through to how the Lord's Supper was conducted, from what could be eaten through to what festivals must be observed, all of those were a scaffolding erected by men and women that hid the truth of Jesus. And it was time to tear it down. Jesus was about the freedom of forgiveness. Come to me, all those who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus was about God's grace that restores broken people and does not burden them. Jesus was about the life of loving obedience that looked to the significance of God and the love of others. The yoke of Jesus was easy, restorative, a statement of salvation by grace through faith because of God's love. Zwingli said, If you'll fast, do so. If you don't wish to eat meat, eat it not. 
but leave Christians a free choice in the matter. At the heart of Zingley's proclamation at this point was the evidence of God's word. There was no Lent in God's word and neither was there a prohibition of meat eating under Jesus Christ. For Zwingli, it was the authority of God's word that is crucial. If it doesn't command it, there is freedom in observation within the good news of Jesus. Now, please don't misunderstand Zwingli. Okay? He was not against obedience, nor was he against the recognition of rules from God's word. What he was opposed to was the imposition of things that we were free to do or not do and the making of regulations from that so that you needed to do it to be saved. In essence, the Reformation proper started with a sausage sizzle in Zurich. And within 12 months, the town council invited two public debates, Zwingli versus the theologians of the established church, so the competing ideas could be assessed publicly. Zwingli argued from the Bible and argued so comprehensively from the truth of God's word that the town council voted unanimously to pursue the Reformation. At that point, Zwingli put out his 67 theses. It was a little shorter than Martin Luther at that point, but it laid the foundation for what would happen. Not a systematic approach. It was a little sporadic, but by April 1525, the Reformation was in full swing. A new Lord's Supper service was celebrated and changes happened. Education boomed. Social welfare was implemented. Theological teaching changed. It is so important for us to grasp the impact of that sausage night. As Anglicans, as Kim has encouraged us, like those from every other denomination, we must submit our deeply held and dearly loved traditions and practices to God's word. Uh, Let me just pick two. There's no service of confirmation in the Bible. Being confirmed is not necessary for salvation. And so we hold it lightly. It's a good thing to do, but it's not commanded by the word of God. And the same, on the other hand, for something like a parish council. (laughs) Don't all cheer and think we're going to get rid of it. There's no parish council in God's word. There is leadership, and the leadership is collegial. But we hold it lightly, and we submit everything to God's word. They're good things, those two, but they're not mandatory in God's word. Uh, The transformation, at point five on the outline, the transformation of the Lord's Supper by Zwingli in Zurich was part of rethinking how God's mob met under the guidance of God's word. Uh, Zwingli recognised the way in which tradition and custom had misdirected the devotion of God's mob. Zwingli was an incredibly accomplished musician. He wrote hymns and he played the organ. But he noticed how choirs and organ music and songs had become the object of devotion in the meeting of God's people. So he got rid of them. He loved music. He loved playing. He loved singing. But if it took people away from knowing Jesus and became imposed, he was willing to deal with it. He transformed the language of the meeting through the plain language of the marketplace and he transformed the mass into the Lord's Supper, submitting everything to God's word. The key was in that passage we read from Luke 22 for Zwingli. Jesus sat there at the Passover meal with his disciples and he displayed how the Passover meal was fulfilled in him. Remember what he said in verse 19? Do this in remembrance. Well done, remembrance of what Jesus has already achieved for you. And so as Vingley looked at what the Mass was and that the Lord's Supper should be, his understanding of the incarnation, the ascension, and the nature of Jesus transformed everything. The Lord's Supper was a sacrament, not of piety and good deeds, but of a promise realised by God. The Lord's Supper was established because Jesus had done it all. The Lord's Supper wasn't going to make up for anything. The Lord's Supper was, in the long practice of the Passover, a remembering of what God had achieved. You never re-sacrifice Jesus. No altar, just a table. No priest to intercede, just a really good waiter, God willing. The elements, as we see in this picture, were really reduced. 
The bread and the wine were not Jesus' real body and blood. He was seated bodily next to God. They're a picture of what God has done in Jesus Christ. In fact, this led him to having a disagreement with Martin Luther where they argued over the importance of one word, is. And Zwingli insisted that Jesus is not there, he is seated there. And the implements he used had no religious significance. Just a plain cup, a plain plate, bread baked that morning and wine fermented the day before. It helps us understand everything we do in the Lord's Supper. What we do is celebrate what Jesus has already achieved and points to that. Finally, before I finish very quickly, Zwingli's understanding of God's word led him to understand the way in which it transformed all of society. That's why that statue is there. So for Zwingli, the method was very simple. He would preach God's word and then he'd sit with God's mob and the town and work out how to practice it across every level of society. Now, I'm not up for imposing God's word by the sword. I think Zwingli might have overreached at that point. But what I do like about what Zwingli did is that it makes me feel uncomfortable because Zwingli applied all of God's word to all of life. There were no limits. All of God's word to all of life, from how we deal with social welfare to what we view when it comes to military service, to government policy, to when you can eat sausages, through to education and how to care for the poor. Zwingli argued everything must be seen through the word of God. That was the vision that led Zwingli to the battlefield, wasn't it? And as a chaplain, it cost him his life as he understood the vision of God. I think Zwingli is instructive to us in so many areas. We've just touched on four. There is so much more about his life. Read about him. Think about him. But at least this is obvious. Zwingli was a very simple man who did very simple things. And they had an amazing impact. He reminds us not to complicate being God's mob. It's simply about the words of God. The words of God loved and devoured, and the word of God is sufficient to be the ultimate guide in all things. That was the essence of Zwingli, the whole word of God simply, and that's how he handled it, preached it, and applied it. At every moment in his life, he asked, what does God's word clearly say? What does God's word say? clearly say? It's a really simple question, isn't it? And then he opened God's word, read it, and thought through how to apply it. Here's a suggestion. Uh, Sometime in the next week, you'll eat a sausage. If not at home, maybe at Bunnings. Why don't you think through how simple actions like that can remind us of the simple truths of the Reformation? Simply the word of God and everything submitted to that. Let me pray. Father, thank you for Zwingli. Thank you for the truth of your word. Father, thank you that it is simply the revelation of your nature and reaches its climax in the life, death, and resurrection of your son. Father, help us to apply all of your word to all of life. In Jesus' name, amen.